This program contains coarse language and images that may disturb some viewers. Major Gill, uh, would you state your full name, please? Um, Andrina Marie Gill. Uh, your occupation? Army officer. Now, you're aware of the fact that I've been appointed a, uh, an investigating officer pursuant to the Australian Defence Inquiry Regulations uh, to inquire into uh, certain matters raised by you in a formal complaint and statement, undated but furnished to uh, the uh, Australian Defence Force. Yes. In 1999, Captain Andrina Gill was a New Zealand Defence Force legal officer during the military intervention in East Timor. I am admitted to the bar as a barrister and solicitor of the High Court of New Zealand. During her deployment in the troubled territory, she raised grave concerns with her superiors about what some Australian troops were doing. It was regarding the allegations of torture where New Zealand asked for an explanation from General Cosgrove or a reassurance that Australian troops were not torturing detainees. The torture allegations horrified many in the New Zealand and Australian Defence Forces and shook Andrina Gill's faith in military justice. Sometimes I think I do wish I did nothing. I wish I had said nothing. I wish I had turned my back. But that wasn't really an option. That was not my role. My role was to provide an effective legal check and balance. And that's what I did. She showed a lot of moral courage. Um, she was a tough Invercargill girl with a strength of character. She was legally very correct, uh, very sound, and uh, she showed great strength of character. I admire her for that. Tonight on Four Corners, the second of a two-part investigation into the Australian military's clandestine activities in East Timor in 1999 and allegations of a secret interrogation centre and the mistreatment of Timorese detainees allegations that were sent all the way up the Australian chain of command and sparked a covert investigation by our closest ally, New Zealand. The newly liberated East Timor, 1999. As pro-Indonesian militia waged a campaign of sickening violence, Australian soldiers attempted to maintain law and order. Part of their job was rounding up militia in strongholds like the border town of Suai, the scene of a horrific massacre by militia just before international forces for East Timor arrived. The commander of the response force, obviously with the approval of the commander of the whole Interfet operation, General Cosgrove, decided to see if they could grab whatever militia there were in the Suai area. On October the 6th, 1999, the SAS set a trap using a roadblock set up at this intersection. The first hostilities for Australian troops came after they moved into the troubled southwest town of Suai, conducting a sweep through the area and establishing a roadblock. They fired shots after a truck burst through the checkpoint, injuring four occupants. The SAS troopers detained the four wounded and ten men they suspected might be militia and sent them to the capital, Dili. Soon after, there was an ambush in Suai. Two Australian soldiers were wounded and two militia killed. 
In Dili, the detainees were wrongly being blamed for the ambush. When they were brought into Dili, the word that was told to everyone was that these 10 were involved into that ambush. So everyone believed that those 10 detainees were a part of the ambush, which is totally incorrect. In Dili, Interfet had set up this dedicated detention centre to deal with anyone rounded up by their forces. It was run by the military police. Seems to be happy snap day today. The detention centre was where all detainees should have been taken to first. However, the 10 that came in from Suai never made it to the detention centre. Instead of being taken to the official detention centre, the 10 detainees were taken to a restricted area at this heliport, controlled by the Australian SAS. Military police later described how secret it was. It was all hush-hush, top-secret sort of stuff. It wasn't supposed to exist. Were you aware that there was this sort of makeshift interrogation centre that had been set up at the heliport by, we believe, Intelligence Corps and potentially with the involvement of the SAS? I'd heard rumours. I didn't actually go out there. We, we moved from the heliport on day one into the headquarters in town, so... It was, uh, yeah, I had no reason to go out there, so I'd only heard rumours, but I, I, I didn't, it was no more than that. What were the rumours? Oh, I just said there was an interrogation centre at, at the heliport. The secret interrogation centre was run by the Intelligence Corps, whose own commander had questions about their capabilities given the rush to deploy. When push came to shove, we had to get ready in three weeks and people went in there under-trained and under-prepared. The whole catastrophe. One of Andrina Gill's jobs was to oversee the treatment of detainees. I was not aware that there was an existence of an uh, uh, interrogation facility at the heliport until later on where I was advised of the existence of it um, and that interrogation practices were, may be going on in that facility. On the day the Timorese detainees were brought in, Intelligence Sergeant Michael Clary was tasked to guard them for the first few hours at the heliport. These men were all quite small and they were scared uh, they were scared of us. That's the impression I got from almost all of these men, is they had just had the worst experience they were ever going to have in their life. Sergeant Alan Joyce was brought in to help manage the detainees. They were all sitting on the ground, scrolling, hands cuffed, um, blindfolded up. So you go in the tent, it's like, ah, oh, it stinks. Some of them were like scared, shocked, because um, leading up to that, people were told if the Australians get you and you're in trouble, you're in trouble, you might die. And I've had people that we've picked up literally saw themselves from fear. Intelligence officer Matthew Coombs observed some of the initial tactical questioning of the detainees, employing the so-called shock of capture technique designed to keep detainees off guard. Shock of capture is a very important thing uh, on, a, on an active operation like that. You need to try and maintain that as long as possible uh, to facilitate the questioning process. The blindfolded detainees were led in to see the bodies of the two dead militia who had been brought back to Delhi after the firefight at Suai. So they were both in a tent on tables. Um, 
I recall the first one uh, had, a, had a large head wound. Um, I still recall the brain matter um, dripping out on the table even a couple of hours later after the event. The detainees were brought in individually, one at a time, uh, by escorted by two guards um, who generally had to hold them because they were quite scared. I think it was to scare them. They hadn't cleaned them up or anything, so the, the, the one with the head that was caved in, it wouldn't have looked, wouldn't have looked good. There was a little kid, I think he was about 13, if that, he cried and screamed and almost dropped to the ground. We had to hold him up. Uh, there was a body in front and the body to the left. But some physically soiled themselves. Oh, yeah, one, one little, kid, little kid did. The Intelligence Corps staff who were willing to speak to Four Corners say the detainees were shown the dead bodies to identify them. The only way that we could identify these dead men was to bring the detainees in one at a time in a very controlled environment and ask them, do you know this man? Did I see reactions from detainees? I didn't expect you, bet I did, yeah. Um, there was a lot of screaming. Regular Australian soldiers were brought in to act as guards and they were given very strict instructions by the SAS about how to treat the detainees. If they nodded off, we were told to put our knee in the middle of their back and wrench their head back. When I was shown this, I thought it was a bit rough. One of the interrogators later offered an insight into their techniques. One of the actual particular prisoners I interrogated, he urinated himself during the session. It's probably due to the fact that he was five foot zero and I'm six foot eight and I was yelling at him. So you get that. Four Corners can reveal that foreign soldiers were appalled by what they saw the Australians do to the detainees. One was a British Special Forces officer. I saw that they were kept in a stress position, that is, sitting cross-legged and hands behind head. I was invited to assist in the exploitation of these people. However, I refused this invitation. My refusal was based on my observations of the conduct of the guard force, who didn't appear to be well trained. He raised his concerns with an Australian intelligence officer and an SAS member involved in the interrogations. I then removed the remainder of my staff from any involvement in the exploitation process. The allegations were passed on to Andrina Gill by an Australian military police officer while the detainees were still being held at the heliport. What he told me was stress positions, physical harm, withholding of food and water, uh, keeping someone naked in stress positions. Were there allegations of any physical beatings as well? Yes, there were. Did you ever inspect this interrogation centre at the heliport? No, I wasn't able to inspect that, no. Did you try? I did, I did try, uh, but I didn't get anywhere. In your view, was the treatment of these detainees with stress positions, withholding food, in some cases water, blindfolding, was that legal in your view? I don't believe that it was legal. Uh, well, I've gone on the Iraq mission with them. Yeah. In 1999, David Freeman was an Australian Defence Force lawyer in the Interfet Legal Office. He also topped his class at Oxford University in humanitarian law. His task was to train soldiers in the rules of engagement, the use of force and how they were to treat people in detention. But he was never consulted about the interrogation centre at the heliport or what was going on there. Is it legal to interrogate a civilian? Um, they'd have to be regarded as a security prisoner to do that, so the answer is no. Is it legal if you suspect they're militia? Yeah, I, I, until a determination's made that they're not militia, then yes, they were allowed to interrogate them. And if you find out that they're not militia, what happens then? Well, the interrogation have to cease and the person would have to be repatriated. And is it legal to interrogate someone who's not an adult, a child? I would think not. The legal basis for the whole mission was international human rights law. So any of those detainees, if they were regarded um, prima facie as security detainees, they still had to be accorded all those protections under international human rights law. 
So does that mean that they could be blindfolded, kept bound in stress positions, deprived of food, water, sleep? Um, not knowing the um, standard operating procedures for the School of Military Intelligence, uh, I would say no. Andrina Gill took the allegations to her boss, the Chief Interfet Legal Officer. Four Corners has obtained this tape recording from 2001, where she tells members of the Australian Defence Force how he responded. He made jokes about it. He couldn't understand the concerns that I raised because the allegations were quite broad. Right, OK. Yeah. First of all, he made jokes about it. Yes, he did. What sort of jokes? Um, made j jokes that um, doesn't matter if the militia are being wrapped up a bit and who cares about whether they've not been given or withdrawn food and water and what's the big deal. Why wasn't she listened to within the legal office itself? Um, I think we had a dysfunctional leader in our uh, leading our legal office. He bullied her and he would speak down to her, he wouldn't listen to her, and if she had issues, she'd be cut off in conversation. And um, I found this very rude, very unprofessional, and um, yeah, I thought it was a very poor style of leadership. When General Cosgrove learned of the allegations of the detainee mistreatment, he ordered an on-the-spot investigation. In a memo, the head of the interrogation centre reported that... Detainees were treated humanely and in accordance with the guidance outlined under the Geneva Conventions. The detainees were given water regularly and adequate food. The detainees were treated firmly, but at no stage were the detainees physically mistreated or harmed. A memo obtained by Four Corners reveals Cosgrove advised no recommendation for further inquiry and no further action required. Sir Peter Cosgrove told Four Corners the investigation found that what was reported was not beyond the bounds of propriety. Andrina Gill recalls a conversation in the legal office about the detainees involving General Cosgrove. And there was a conversation about these concerns mm -hmm. about mistreatment mm -hmm. at the, the interrogation centre. What, what did General Cosgrove have mm -hmm. to say about mm -hmm. that that you heard? Well, what he said was that he, he, he didn't accept that detainees would be physically beaten and he didn't accept that they should be stripped naked. And, but he felt that handcuffs and blindfolds were OK. And, he also said he was unconcerned about the food and water situation. Being withheld. Mm. Sir Peter Cosgrove told Four Corners that during detention and interrogations that it is important that no physical violence other than ordinary restraint be used. Hitting was not permitted. Food and water must be provided, hygiene and health needs provided for. The decision was made to shut down the secret interrogation centre. Andrina Gill was still dissatisfied with the response to the allegations that she had raised. So what I did is I raised it through um, our New Zealand chain of command. He sanctioned me to do a low-level investigation review and just to see whether there was any legitimacy to what the MPs were saying. Andrina Gill's investigation was to be kept secret from the Australians. So what I did is I tried to interview all the people that I could. And I must say it was quite limited. I had limited access to people. I had to be very low key about it um, to find out information. Four Corners has obtained a number of classified New Zealand military minutes that list the allegations Andrina Gill was looking into, including... Sleep deprivation, stripping and being left naked for long periods of time, stress positions, withholding of food and water. The New Zealand military took a very different view of the allegations to the Australians. In a secret minute, an officer from the New Zealand legal directorate said... The overall tenor of these allegations is that the detainees are being treated inhumanely and with a lack of respect for their human dignity. 
The information Andrina Gill gathered sent shockwaves right up the New Zealand chain of command. The question is not purely one of whether such treatment reaches the severity of a grave breach of international law. It is rather whether, in the circumstances of this particular operation, it is proper at all. This may ultimately require that we do not hand detainees that we have captured to interfet for interrogation. The allegations of detainee mistreatment were referred up to the New Zealand Chief of Defence, who dispatched an envoy with very specific instructions to go and see General Cosgrove. In the course of your discussions with Cosgrove, you should also informally refer to the sense of unease which Captain Gill's report has engendered. Seek clarification of the situation from Cosgrove's perspective. The next month, the envoy outlined the outcome of his discussions with General Cosgrove. Cosgrove stressed that he had clearly directed that detainees were not to be ill-treated. His staff was well aware that this exploitation was not to include depriving detainees of food and water. The Kiwis were apparently satisfied with General Cosgrove's assurances but there was still disquiet among some in the Australian ranks. Well, later on, I think about a year later, maybe, um, I got asked to speak to the Chief of Defence Force and he told me that the Australians had initiated an investigation The allegations became part of an investigation by the Australian Military Police, one lasting more than two years and spanning four countries. The key witnesses were the Timorese detainees. Military Police investigators managed to get statements from three of the 14 men. Four Corners has managed to track down 11 of them. For the first time, we hear their stories. Jacobus Mao is one of them. Saya ngeri sekali. Saya tidak pernah bicara karena kalau bicara saya pikirkan kita orang tua ini takut stroke kan? Takut. Nah, jadi saya takut sekali. Tidak pernah bicara anak saya yang sebesar pun saya tidak pernah bicara dengan dia. Bus conductor Florindo Maniz Cardoso was also taken by the Australians. He was asked repeatedly if he was a member of the militia. Tambahaula comprende Liafuan militia. One of the detainees we spoke to, Julio de Silva, was 16 years old at the time. Anton saya di sini, pukul saya di sini, saya langsung jatuh ke belakang. Kasih berdiri, kasih duduk lagi saya. Kasih duduk lagi saya. Lalu saya punya belakang ini sakit. Keram jadi saya tondok begini juga, pakai senjata antam di belakang sini, tendang di belakang sini sampai saya jatuh ke depan. Another of the detainees was farmer Valdemar Daniri. He suffered from a severe hearing impairment, which meant he struggled to communicate, even among his fellow Timorese. He spoke to us with the help of his neighbour, Julio Guzmán de Arujo. Yeah, my can yakan kulela tene, yang sa sa reitwan, 
nebe ema kaertia ema balukan latene bak ema bakunia In a statement given to two military police investigators in 2001, Valdemar alleged that while at the heliport he was deprived of sleep, kicked in the stomach, had his jaw squeezed and his face punched, making his nose bleed. Speaking to Four Corners, he also recalled being forced to look at the bodies of the two dead militia. <laughs> Yeah. They went to town on him because he w couldn't answer the questions. He couldn't answer the questions because he couldn't hear what they were saying. So when he was taken in Suai, he didn't answer any of the questions and didn't operate or behave in the manner that they wanted him to operate. They thought he was highly trained or something, and I, my understanding was that he got a bit more treatment, which is rather embarrassing when you look back on it. One of the detainees, Celestino de Andrade, told the Australians when he was detained in Suai, he was an Indonesian TNI soldier. He was interrogated at least five times at the heliport. Mereka siksa kami itu dipukul, ditendam, disi diinjak. Kita yang apa duduk yang tidak tidak tegak juga dia langsung tendang kita. Harus duduk yang tegak begini. Malahan mereka itu diskusi di siksa kami itu bilang kalau tentara Indonesia dia mereka mereka tidak senang. Army records show the intelligence officers quickly accepted that his claims of being a soldier were true, but they continued to interrogate him. Is it legal to interrogate a member of another military? <laughs> uh, no, it's not, not legal to interrogate. I mean, we're a peacekeeping force and there was still obviously, uh, I'm assuming you might be referring to TNI or Indonesia. Um, they were their own sovereign force and um, they had, Indonesia had acceded to the United Nations to allow us to be there to carry out the UN mandate. So, um, we had no right to interrogate TNI soldiers. So what should interrogators do once they accept that a detainee is a soldier of another sovereign nation? Uh, immediately inform your chain of command and have some diplomatic um, speak where the person's repatriated with no harm done to them. And stop the interrogation? Absolutely. Of all the detainees at the heliport, Bartholomew's Ulu was singled out for special treatment because the Australians believed he was a member of the Indonesian Special Forces, Kapasis. Betul, mereka curiga saya bahwa saya ini anggota milisi atau Kopassus. Makanya mereka perlakuan saya seperti yang tidak wajar, seperti binatang. Sehingga saya dihantam juga, hantam yang betul-betul dihantam. Waktu itu kan memang saya disiksa betul-betul. Sampai saya ditendang, sampai tidak sadarkan diri. Witness statements from six Australian soldiers obtained by Four Corners confirm other claims that Bartholomew's Ulu was blindfolded and tormented. The Copasa soldier was made to stand and spin him around a number of times to make him lose his concentration. This was done by tapping a tin-like drum. One tap he was told to stand up, two taps was to run or jog on the spot, and three was for him to sit down again. This was done on a regular basis, about every five or ten minutes. Kami dengar ada bunyi seng-seng rusak di samping kiri kanan tenda itu. Jadi mereka pukul-pukul supaya kami tidak bisa tidur. Kami sudah Bartholomew's Ulu would be interrogated at least ten times. Even now, Ulu insists he was a civilian, but says he was forced to confess to being Kapasis while being interrogated. He says he was sexually assaulted. Saya pernah duduk 24 jam, duduk siap 24 jam. Berdiri 24 jam, mata diikat, 
tangan diikat. Terus mereka kasih telanjang saya, mereka raba-raba kemaluan saya. Nah, itu yang saya sempat, saya malu di situ. Karena itu kan satu pelecehan seksual buat seorang tawanan perang, tawanan masyarakat sipil. Itu satu pelecehan. Waktu itu kan saya badan kosong memang. Tinggal mereka kasih turun celana, semua celana dalam, semua turun. Nah, waktu itu baru mereka raba-raba kemaluan saya. Yang waktu raba-raba itu juga bukan interview laki-laki, perempuan. Dan tidak tahu pemeriksaan apa, kita juga tidak tahu. Habis itu mereka ambil keterangan lanjutan. Pertanyaan lanjutan. Sir Peter Cosgrove told Four Corners, I was not aware of this. I find this grotesque and criminally actionable. Four Corners should provide all necessary assistance to the ADF to identify the perpetrator. Another disturbing case was that of detainee 134, a man named Nardis Bao. Bao had been wounded back in Suai after the Australians opened fire on the truck that tried to run their roadblock. Tutu saya luka parah. Kaki dua-dua ini, tangan dua, yang kaki sebelah kanan ini parah. Bao was taken to hospital and placed under military police guard with another wounded detainee. Two days later, an Australian soldier turned up demanding to take him away for questioning. The Australian was attached to the SAS and wore no rank or name tags. He would only tell them his name was Wayne. This Wayne turned up at the hospital. He basically said that he's the intelligence spook and he's got business with this bloke. And basically, fuck off and let him do his job. Kejadian itu waktu kami dua tidur, saya kaget, itu tentara dua itu mau tembak saya. Investigators were told the military police guarding the wounded men resisted Wayne's attempt to take them away. They put up a bit of a fight and said, well, you're not having him. He eventually got his way. This person physically walked in, grabbed him by the thing and just dragged him out as if he was a rag doll. So how would you describe the treatment of Nardis Bao? I think it was deplorable, absolutely deplorable. I mean, the, the blokes got s serious injuries and then to drag him out of, a, out of a hospital, you know, like a rag doll was, you know, just downright disgusting. And where was he dragged to? Back to the heliport. So they've come into the hospital mm. and taken a wounded man out mm. in front of the doctors. Mm. So I, I asked for more information about that because I guess, again, risk management, I understand if he would want to be questioned, I think it's important. He might have some valuable intelligence, but he was also under our medical care and he had, had been subject to gunshot wounds. So uh, I asked more detail about that and they informed me that he was grabbed and dragged, possibly dragged from the bed. And also he was slapped hardly during that process enough to cause him to stumble or fall. It's outrageous. I mean, you can't do that. And especially if the person was injured and needed medical care under Geneva law or any law, that, you know, the um, you have to administer the proper first aid medical care to... Uh, any prisoner, and for them to be dragged out of a hospital and then interrogated was, I use the word outrageous, and unlawful. Another wounded detainee, Carlos Verdiel, was also dragged out of the hospital with Nardis Bao. Okay, mungkin tu begitu saya belum bisa berdiri, belum kaki masih tidak bisa. Saya sudah terpaksa keluar. Begitu keluar dan keluar, Pak, saya langsung di mata saya diikat. Tangan saya di borgol, borgol plastik, Pak. At the interrogation center, Bao and Verdial were made to sit in the dirt under the holding tent with the other detainees. Then they were taken for interrogation. Ambil keterangan habis. Setelah ambil habis, langsung ikat matanya bawa kas masuk kami di terpal Tidak tidur juga kita jatuh mereka datang kasih bangun tendang pukul lalu di situ kami 
langsung tutup mata, langsung borgol, luka lebih parah sampai ini. The detainees describe how three and a half days after they were first picked up at Suai, they were moved to the official detention centre in the dark of night. As they were being thrown into the back of a truck, an SAS soldier cocked his weapon. The detainees began screaming, fearing they were about to be shot. Yeah, dorong betul. Buang tangan itu kan di borgol, buang kasih naik. Ini tutup kan punya ikat dengan kain kan punya mata ini. Baru buang ke babi. Naik ke atas mobil. Putus mulai saya mulai re emosi saya. Wah, ini kita ini datang di sini disiksa habis sekarang mau tengah malam ini berarti mau dibunuh. A military police officer was moved to write in his diary about the condition of the hearing impaired Valdemar Daniri when he was brought to the official detention centre. Collected detainee from Heliport pissed his pants, obvious that he had been fucked over by SAS, who had captured, detained him, and by intelligence, who had interrogated him. The man was shit scared. But he was particularly shocked by the condition of Nada Spau. One wound in the arm showed signs of weeping blood and pus. The bandage was soaked in the blood. This East Timorese person needed hospitalisation and intravenous antibiotics. The military police gave a, a description of his injuries when he turned up at the uh, detention centre and they felt that his wounds were infected and there, were, there was ulcerations on his body. And they told me what they did is they sent him straight back to the hospital. He wasn't the only Australian upset by the condition of Bao's gunshot wounds. You go within sort of five feet of him and you'd straight away smell this stench of like rotting flesh type smell. Once the doctor removed the bandages, there was maggoty type of animals, you know, insects and shit crawling around. And again, he was horrified at it. Is that in your mind a clear breach of pretty well all of the things we're talking about, whether it's international human rights law, Geneva Conventions, uh, laws of armed conflict? Well, at first blush, yes. Yes, it is a breach. They are breaches of international human rights law and international humanitarian law. Frustrated and concerned by the treatment of the detainees, several of the military police confronted the deputy head of the Interfet Legal Office. One recounted what that officer said. You've been told to get on with the fucking job. I'm sick and tired of you continually bringing this shit up. Shut your fucking mouth. The commander of the interrogation centre later told the military investigators that he regularly briefed General Cosgrove. Did General Cosgrove ever come in and view your facility? No, he didn't. But... He did not, but I did have, I did report to him almost on an hourly basis. So he was aware of the facility and he never said. Absolutely, he was. I physically went to his office to brief him as to what was happening. And two others told investigators they were informed the centre had been authorised at the highest level. I was assured that we had top cover from General Cosgrove for the interrogation. Sir Peter Cosgrove told Four Corners, there is no doubt that I would have been briefed routinely among a great deal of other operational, logistic, civil, military affairs, etc., during major daily briefings, widely attended by key staff and commanders. He said he didn't recall briefings on the interrogation centre being singular and focused. Four Corners has been told that in the end, the interrogations at the heliport gleaned very little with the commanding officer of the SAS who helped round them up, later admitting the detainees were of minimal value. These persons I would describe as local farmers with a low security interest. Problem is, as far as we could make out, they had no inkling of being militia or anything. At the most, they were just a bunch of guys in the wrong place at the wrong time. So when they're getting interrogated, they can't give them any information on militia because they're not in the militia. 
As for the mistreatment of the detainees at the Heliport Interrogation Centre, the military police investigation assembled briefs of evidence for charges of torture to be considered against three intelligence officer commanders who ran the interrogation centre. The final report by the military police found the interrogations breached the guidelines and policies set down by the United Nations, the Australian Government, the Army and Interfet. The briefs of evidence contained 70 statements and alleged that over three days at the heliport, in an attempt to gain confessions, detainees were subjected to sleep deprivation, food deprivation, restriction of basic hygiene facilities and other methods of mental abuse. I guess as a lawyer I'd say, look, there's things are investigated and if there's um, serious wrongdoings, well then, if that meets the threshold of preferring charges, well then that should occur. Four Corners has obtained an email from the Director of Army Personnel that says the three commanders were to be charged within a month. But no one was ever charged. Defence refused to tell Four Corners why. At the time, the Chief of the Army told media that no offences had been committed. They were treated in a robust manner, but all of the time they were treated properly and correctly under the Geneva Convention. Military lawyers decided that even though the evidence did support charges, it would be unfair to prosecute because the interrogation centre commanders were following their training. The treatment of the detainees was in line with all of our training, our doctrine and operational frameworks that were in place at that time. I didn't see anything outside of that that concerned me or thought that there were any the teenage detainees were being treated in a way contrary to that. The Army did later admit that detainees were mistreated, but they said nothing was illegal. How does that, in your mind, reflect on the legacy of Australia's intervention in East Timor? Well, if this can be proven, uh, then that sadly diminishes, I think, what was an excellent, and it was regarded by the UN as a, a, the textbook on how to run the modern day peacekeeping operation. Let's talk a little bit about your treatment. For Andrina Gill, her refusal to drop the mistreatment allegations made her the subject of extreme hostility within the Interfet legal office. I was effectively uh, ostracised and uh, I think treated, I think a dog would have been treated better than the way I was treated by the senior legal officers. It's no stretch to say that the highest levels of the Australian military wanted your head on a block after all this, didn't they? Well, I can understand that. Um, you know, to get a representation from New Zealand to say, hey, you need to check your processes to make sure that we're comfortable with this and we have our own mandate and we have our own standards, I can understand why the, it was upset. But I guess the message that I, I want to convey is that there were significant attempts to deal with it on the ground first. The Australian Defence Force found that the behaviour of her boss, Australian Lieutenant Colonel Drew Braben, was dismissive, rude and unacceptable. Braben referred to Captain Gill as girly and stupid or stupid woman. You got an apology of sorts from one level, though, at one point, too, didn't you? Can you, you tell me about that? It's cathartic for me because I can now say to everybody that it was accepted that I was um, very poorly treated. Andrina Gill believes that allowing a sense of impunity to prevail in East Timor has had serious consequences. It's really important for us to consider what we call operational creep. And what that means is, is history is littered with examples. I mean, a fictitious example is Lord of the Flies is the obvious one. But if you don't consider and I guess shut off or dampen down small illegalities, then they can creep to major ones. Had things been done the way that it should have been done, we wouldn't be sitting here today. There wouldn't be questions over what many people see was a really incredibly successful deployment.
Four Corners spoke to more than 130 people connected to these events. Many of them believe the lack of accountability in East Timor helped create a culture that enabled Australian war crimes in Afghanistan just a few years later. I believe honestly that as a result of that, it caused problems later on down the track that we now all know of that happened in Afghanistan. So you believe that this is sort of a link in the chain to Afghanistan? I, I honestly do. Um, I recall that at the end of all the proceedings, and, and, and I was pretty much the one, last one standing with the, the thing, I did all the clean-up of all the case, the case files, all the evidence, all that sort of stuff. And I remember saying to my OC afterwards, I said, uh, ma'am, this is going to come back and bite us on the arse. Unfortunately, it only takes one or two bad apples to spoil a, a bunch. For the veterans of the Timor intervention, there is justifiable pride that they help bring peace and stability to one of Australia's closest neighbours. But it has also left deep scars. I know that we did good. I know that we cut out a cancer from that community. A violent, hateful cancer in what are normally very peaceful people. So that aspect, that was good. We did, we did a good job. I look back sometimes and I think to myself, was it worth it? And I have to say personally, no, it was not worth it. No. Did I do my job and did I make a difference? I think we did, for sure. Yeah, but I couldn't wait to leave and I never want to go back. <laughs>